So the second part of the metabolism uh, discussion, if you will, here's an example of, uh, we're going to talk about energy specifically, and here's some jellyfish that are bioluminescent, which means that they take some of the energy, some of the energy they take in, they use to make light. And uh, so a quick review, remember that metabolism is the total sum of an organism's chemical reactions. But remember that uh, metabolism is taking, oh, sorry about that, is taking, breaking apart a particle, remember that gives off energy, or building a particle, which means you have to put energy in. So we're going to spend some time today talking about energy a little bit. A quick uh, overview. In organisms, chemical reactions happen pretty much in what are called pathways, biochemical pathways, where you start with a molecule, and it's a series of reactions to get to a product. And we're going to be looking at uh, some biochemical pathways pretty soon. Okay, along the way, there are, in this one drawn, there are three chemical reactions. And those three chemical reactions are each driven by an enzyme. We're going to spend time with enzymes later to get to a product. Okay, so matter, different kind of matter, different kind of matter, different kind of matter. This is where we want it to end up. That's called a biochemical or a metabolic pathway. And review then, I'm going to go through this very quickly. A catabolic pathway would release energy because we're cutting, we're breaking apart and releasing energy. An anabolic pathway would use energy to build something bigger. So we call the study of bioenergetics how organisms actually manage their energy resources. So a quick review of energy then. Uh, this is something you should probably already know. Kinetic energy is energy associated with motion. This would be, we also use the term work, a force moving through a distance. Heat energy is also considered kind of random energy. Heat energy is the random movement of atoms or molecules. Generally, heat cannot be used by an organism. Potential energy is the energy that matter possesses because of its location or structure. So we have, uh, and we'll look at this in a minute, chemical energy is an example of potential energy available to release in a chemical reaction. And we're really going to, in organisms, we're really going to spend a lot of time talking about chemical energy. And energy can be converted from one form to another, but not lost. We'll see that too. So here's an example. Diver with potential energy, potential energy be converted to kinetic energy, and when he hits the water down here, he's not going to have potential energy. He'll have used all the kinetic energy. So, a couple uh, energy laws. The first law of thermodynamics, the energy of the universe is constant, just like matter. So, energy can be transformed and transformed, but not created or destroyed. Very important idea. The second law of thermodynamics, this is second up there, sorry, is that during energy, every transfer or transformation, some energy is unusable, often losses heat. According to that law, then, every energy transfer or transformation increases what we call the entropy or disorder of the universe, that we go from an ordered state to a more disordered state, that some energy is lost as heat, and heat is this random movement of molecules that can't be used. We'll come back to the word entropy a little bit later. So, here's a quick example. Here's the first law of thermodynamics. The energy in the gazelle is being taken up by the cheetah. Where did the gazelle get its energy? Well, the gazelle got its energy from eating the plants here. Where did the plants get their energy? Well, they got it from the sun. So energy is being transferred and transformed. 
in the second law, now the cheetah is running. It's giving off heat energy. It's losing water and carbon dioxide because it's taking the food it ate and breaking it down into those two things, which we'll come back to later. That's the second law of thermodynamics. So living cells unavoidably convert organized forms of energy to heat. Something called a spontaneous process will occur without energy put in. If a process occurs without energy put in, it has to increase the entropy of the universe because if you're not putting any energy in, you're just breaking, generally breaking something apart. It's spontaneous. You have to be adding material to the universe. So a couple examples of how organisms use energy in a couple terms. Because when we talk about energy and heat with organisms, we generally use the terms warm-blooded and cold-blooded. We have. Now you're going to use the term endotherm and ectotherm. An endotherm, a.k.a. warm-blooded, is an organism that controls its own body heat, for example. Okay, that... The river otter is using the heat that it is generating to heat itself. Whereas a largemouth bass is an ectotherm. The largemouth bass, the heat, its body temperature is the same as the environmental temperature, and that's what this graph is showing you. Now let's take a look at why this may or may not be important in a minute. Here is an interesting graph from Chapter 40 in your book that looks at the difference between three different kinds of endotherms and three different kinds of ectotherms and their ener annual energy expenditure and then ener energy expenditure per unit mass. Now check this out. A, and I, I just want to compare ectotherms and endotherms in this. We can talk about differences in body and stuff later. A female python, if you look at this graph, spends zero energy heating herself. Now that's a really important idea because if you don't have to spend any energy to heat yourself, you don't need to take in as much energy. Because look at, for example, a deer mouse. Look at all the energy it spends just keeping itself warm. And we can talk later about why there's a difference between a deer mouse and a human and the amount of energy it spends to keep itself warm. Okay? So a python has to spend absolutely no energy keeping itself warm, which means it has to take in less energy. So if you're a python, you don't have to eat as much. Important idea. Okay? Two different strategies for body temperature. Endotherm and ectotherm. As an example of energy use. All right. So now we're going to get into a little bit of a more difficult topic, I think, and that's the idea of free energy. Free energy or delta G. Yes, you have to know delta G. A system's free energy is energy that can do work. It's available for work when temperature and pressure are uniform. And if you're in a cell, temperature and pressure are uniform in there. Okay? This equation is on your formula sheet. The change in free energy, delta G, during a process is related to the change in enthalpy, or change in total energy, delta H, and change in entropy, O, the disorderedness of the universe, T delta S. T is temperature. Now check this out. So if T gets higher, entropy is higher. Well, that makes sense because T is, is disordered random movement of molecules. Only processes with a negative delta G are spontaneous or will happen. Okay? So, spontaneous processes can be harnessed to perform, quote, there's our word again, work. Work. So, we're looking for things that have negative delta G in order for us to do something. For me to move my arm, there has to be a chemical reaction, okay, or... To be, for that process to be spontaneous, it has to have a negative delta G. 
So there's a lot written on here. Free energy is a measure of a system's instability. It's tendency to be able to change to a more stable state. And I'm going to show you a few examples of this. During a change, free energy decreases and the stability increases, which kind of makes sense. Things want to be, or things move to stability. Equilibrium is a state of maximum stability. When there's nothing's happening in the system, you're getting no change in energy. And again, a process is spontaneous and can perform work only when it is moving toward equilibrium. Okay, here are three examples of this. Lots of free energy. As he jumps off, this is the more stable state. Why? Gravity, right? Unstable. If this board were to disappear, he's going to fall. Stable is being in the water. Okay? That kinetic energy is because we have higher, more free energy here, less there. This system has lots of free energy because it's not stable. This is diffusion. Particles don't want to be next to each other. They want to be apart, kind of like you in the lunchroom. So, they move apart. More stable state. Chemical reaction. This is held together with lots of chemical energy. Free energy. You're like, well, free, it's not, okay. Free doesn't mean that it's not bound up somewhere. It's just able to be used. And now, as this broke apart, energy is given off. Energy is given off in that chemical reaction because we went from big thing to a bunch of smaller things. We broke bonds. Here's a couple more examples in a chemical reaction. I'll, we'll talk, talk about examples of these. An exergonic reaction is one where energy is released, burning a piece of paper. Okay, The paper has lots of free energy. Here's free energy up the side, has lots of free energy. We have to get the reaction started. That's called reactivation energy. Once we do, as the product, as the paper burns, the products have less energy. Okay? And so we go from this amount of free energy to that amount of free energy, which would mean we lost negative delta G. We lost free energy. We can't use the products to get more energy because they don't have very much. In a reaction called an endergonic reaction, The reactants on this side, you need energy put in to make the products. Okay? We have to put energy in to make the products. Building muscle is an endergonic reaction. We have to we have to take we have to take the things we've eaten and put them together to make products. That requires energy. Delta G has to be positive. The change in free energy is positive. I hope you're still with me. If not, we'll go over this. A couple examples. Okay, and uh, if we close up this hydroelectric system and we have water in here and water in here and water is flowing downhill, spinning this, okay, this has more free energy than this. Delta G is, so we're getting electrical light. Here, they're the same. We would call it equilibrium in a cell. No movement, no light. Your body and many cells are actually open systems where you're constantly putting in to one side and dumping out the other and making the wheel turn. We'll come back to this idea with cell respiration, giving off energy. Okay, or maybe like this, where water comes in, and is passed along and passed along and passed along, generating lots of light. That's how a dam works, right? Okay, the motion of the water because of gravity, more free energy here, 
less free energy there just because of position. All right, then. Last thing in this. So in your cells, we have something called ATP. ATP. So this three kinds of work. It has to move things, transport things, which is kind of the same thing, move itself, transport things, and do chemical reactions. To do this work, cells manage energy resources by something called a concept called energy coupling. They use an exergonic process to make an endergonic one happen. In other words, if we want to build something in our body, we have to have energy put into that system. So to do that, a cell uses something called ATP. This is a, should be a bit of review. ATP is adenosine triphosphate. Adenosine triphosphate is a chemical in your cells that's sort of like an energy storage. Uses the bond between the phosphates as energy storage. If you put a little water in, it breaks this bond, giving off a phosphate, and energy is also given off. So how ATP works is by doing what's called phosphorylating reactions. And I'll write that word down in a minute. So for example, this common chemical reaction in you actually has a positive delta G. The reaction won't work. But ATP breaking apart is a negative delta G. So it's a spontaneous reaction. So you get a negative number here. So when you put them together, if you were to put these two reactions together, you can do the math. This is basic algebra. You get a delta G that's negative, and the reaction will happen. But you've got to have both of them. It's called a coupled reaction. Here are some examples of ATP working. Now, you see the word in here, phosphorylate. What ATP does is, since it's that A with three P's attached, one of the P's is attached to the motor protein, for example, and the motor protein then will move. The P will be attached. The protein will move and the P is given off. What happens to the P? It ends up back attached to the ADP eventually. We'll talk about how that works later. Here's another example. This protein in the cell membrane has to open like a revolving door. Well, the energy put in is from the P. ATP phosphorylates it, it opens, and stuff is pumped out. Here's another. Here's our example of our glutamate ammonia reaction phosphorylated, not phosphorylated, the energy is used to put them together. Those are called coupled reactions. So in cells, in cells, reactions are coupled all the time. So how ATP works then is energy comes in, this says from catabolism, endergonic, and this is a misspelling, it should be exergonic energy yielding process. Uh, digestion is the biggest one of food to make ATP. ATP is broken down into ADP. ADP is an A with two P's and that little P floating along. This is phosphorylate, using to phosphorylate it. And that energy is used for cell work. That finally ends our energy lecture.